So we're very excited have to have to welcome this big illustrious panel today because they're doing some really cutting edge and very interesting stuff. And I also want to contrast it with the old stuff, so to speak. I'm not saying that you know <laughs> Tom is old, but um, that there are also existing the existing kind of way of doing things of, of changing value as well as some new ways and some really out there way that it's going to be. <laughs> that I find extremely fascinating because I met Dan about a year ago and I've been really fascinated by her work ever since. And so I'm really excited to present to this panel. The way we'll go through it, it will go from the the most um, established one, uh, which is uh, you know the older technology, and then we'll move on to Ryan, we'll talk about Ripple, and then we'll move on to Dan at the end to, to you know, blow, us, blow us mine. Okay? Um, so without further ado, because I want to leave a lot of time for Q&A, because I, I know there's lots of uh, very knowledgeable people here in the audience as well. So we want to make sure there's a tons of time for all of you to fire questions at the panel. So let's go, Tom. OK, well, I've got a PowerPoint slideshow. I'm in teacher mode now. So this, this is going to be somewhat technical. I hope it doesn't bore you too much. Uh, I'm going to need me to to stand up, I guess, if I'm going to see the slides, and where's the uh, way to advance the slides? I can just stand up, that's yeah. all right. So, are we queued up here? Basis of 
goods and services that are in everyday demand. Uh, not something that's a luxury good uh, that may get uh, a very uh, sporadic demand. Uh, you want to issue a currency based on goods and services that are in everyday demand and already in the market or soon to arrive. In my latest book, The End of Money and the Future of Civilization, I talk about two distinct kinds of credit. Uh, we're dealing with exchange credit when we talk about a currency or a money system because the purpose of money is to facilitate exchange. So a currency should be short-term credit and it should be based. Uh, it should uh, it should be based on uh, goods and services that are available. On the other hand, if you want to buy a house or a car or something like that, uh, you need to have long-term credit, and that needs to come out of surplus that gets generated here. I won't dwell on that. It's important that we localize control of credit. And localizing control of credit means that we can transcend the banking monopoly. Communities can create exchange media that are readily available, that, provide, uh, that are provided at low cost. Uh, we can provide them in sufficient quantities to enable all desirable trades. Uh, making currencies local favors local suppliers because they're the ones that issue it, they're the ones that are going to redeem it. Uh, it enables communities to control their own economy and quality of life. Now, homegrown sources of primary liquidity are private currencies that are emitted by trusted issuers. Now, I talk about trusted issuers uh, because these are the producers that are producing things that many people want. And so if it's a trusted issuer that's issuing the currency, it's going to circulate readily from hand to hand in the community. So what would be an example of a private currency? Uh, let's suppose you had a locally owned electric power company. Do you think if they spent a currency into circulation by paying their workers and suppliers with currency notes that they would circulate in the community? Do you think the local retailers would accept them? Well, of course. Everybody's got an electric bill. So why wouldn't they accept uh, electric power companies' vouchers or currency? Um, and the other thing is credit clearing exchanges, where we have not a single issuer, but an associated group of issuers. Now, the kind of thing that uh, Chong is doing with uh, with Baybox is a mutual credit clearing system. You have an association of uh, businesses that agree to do business with one another without using cash. They use an internal credit ledger, and when you sell something, you get a credit, your account goes up. When you buy something, your account goes down because you get a debit. So it's a very simple process of, of clearing your accounts payable against your accounts receivable your purchases against your sales. And you're allowed to have some leeway in uh, the balances in your account. Uh, the, the big question is, how, how big a negative balance should you be allowed to carry? And that needs to be in proportion to the amount of sales into the system. There are other factors that can be considered, but that's a primary one. But not only can a credit clearing exchange provide moneyless trades amongst the members, but it can externalize the credit of its members by issuing a currency. Suppose Baybucks were to issue a currency, how would it do it? Well, they have some ideas now on how they're planning to do it. But one way they could do it is, let's say you're a member of the trade exchange. Uh, Maybe you run a, a restaurant. Uh, you find that not everything you want is available within the trade exchange. So there's some vendor out there, let's say an electrician, that you want to engage to do some new lighting in your restaurant. 
if you could draw from your account in the credit clearing exchange, let's say some paper vouchers, and if the electrician was willing to accept those vouchers in payment for his services, then you have a currency that's circulating throughout the entire community, not just within the trade exchange. Now, the electrician might be willing to accept that because he knows there are 200 and some odd members in the trade exchange that are going to give him value for it. So who are the providers and forms of local liquidity? Well, local liquidity is uh, basically means of payment. It can be provided by local companies. This is traditionally called the Goods Foundation. Or you can have it issued by utilities and transit providers on the Service Foundation. The municipalities can issue a currency based on their tax foundation. And there is such a thing as a tax anticipation warrant that has a long history of use by municipal governments. Even nonprofit organizations uh, can issue a currency on the basis of pledged donations. So we can create local liquidity through all of these different entities in the community. So here's how it works. Uh, you got a municipal or business issuer. They issue a currency by paying their workers and suppliers, who in turn provide labor services and other services. Uh, those workers can then go to the local merchants with the currency. The merchants will accept it in return for whatever it is they sell. And the merchants can then redeem it with the original issuer for the goods and services that the issuer provides. So we have all these examples of let systems and mutual credit systems and uh, local currencies that have been developing over the last uh, 40 years. Tr commercial trade exchanges in their modern form have been around for 40 years or more. Uh, let systems were developed 25 years ago. Um, we've seen a proliferation of local currencies. Uh, why haven't they thrived? Why haven't they made more of an impact than they have? And I point out these are the major reasons. First of all, ineffective designs. Uh, many community currencies are sold into circulation. As you have to have dollars in order to acquire them, bring them into circulation. That doesn't put any new liquidity into the community, especially if those currencies are redeemable back into dollars, just like Toronto dollars or Salt Spring Island dollars or Berkshires. These are all redeemable back into dollars. So essentially, it's a, it's a like a Target gift card, except Target won't give you dollars for them. You have to redeem them for merchandise. So ineffective design is, is the primary reason why local currencies haven't thrived. Uh, the value foundation has been inadequate. Uh, the amount of currency issued to various uh, users uh, is usually equalized in the mistaken idea that everybody deserves to get the same amount. Well, everybody deserves the same access to, the, uh, to our common heritage, but when it comes to money, money is a device for facilitating exchange. And if you want it to circulate, uh, rapidly and in a healthy way, you have to allocate the bulk of the currency to the producers that are selling the most. You're monetizing the value of their production. Uh, third, uh, let's see, third improper basis of issue. You don't want to issue a currency based on long-term obligation. As I said, you've got exchange credit and investment credit and savings on the other side. Uh, insufficient involvement of the business community. Most uh, local currencies have been issued on the fringe uh, by groups that don't have connections to businesses, and uh, that's the same with LETS as well. And established exchange mechanisms have tremendous advantages uh, for various reasons. They enjoy legal privileges, and people are accustomed to using them and have a hard time conceiving of using anything else. 
So a currency should be spent into circulation by trusted issuers who agree to redeem it for their valuable goods and services, and this is important, at their customary prices. They should not charge premium prices because you're not giving them dollars. So we have, as was mentioned this morning, the Your Business Circle Cooperative, started in 1934. It's still thriving after all these years, 80 years. Uh, we've had a proliferation of commercial barter and trade exchanges. Uh, some big ones like IMS and Barter Card. So why haven't they captured a larger share of the market? Well, trade exchange owners have been very complacent. <coughs> Uh, these are typically for-profit businesses, small businesses uh, operated on a relatively small scale. And they're making money and they're satisfied with their level of success. So they're standing on a hilltop, but they can't see that there's a mountain to be climbed yet. They don't see the enormous potential market when they start uh, achieving the economies of scale. And the membership and transaction fees have been too high. This is partly because of their small scale. Uh, they're not achieving the economies of scale. As they are able to uh, achieve a larger membership base, then they can make a decent profit without uh, charging high fees. And they fail to recognize the financial advantages. They promote uh, their trade exchanges on the basis of the marketing advantages and uh, pretty much that's it. Uh, but basically, if we're offering free interest-free line of credit, uh, that should be a major drawing point. And they fail to penetrate the entire supply chain. Uh, the supply chain consists of uh, basic commodity producers, manufacturers, uh, wholesalers, and then retailers. And they tend to be concentrated at the retail level. And everybody wants to be able to pay their suppliers with the currency. So unless the retailers can pay the wholesalers, and the wholesalers can pay the manufacturers, and the manufacturers can pay the basic commodity producers, uh, you have a limited range of circulation. And you have uh, a limited ability of members to trade with members of other exchanges. It was. Uh, pointed out earlier today that if you can't find what you need in this exchange, maybe you could find it in the San Francisco or in the Los Angeles exchange. And there needs to be some facility for doing that. Right now it's very cumbersome. Uh, the commercial barter industry does have something called UC or universal currency, but it's not direct member to member, it's broker to broker or exchange to exchange. So this is my glimpse into the future. I think this is what's going to happen. We're going to see mutual credit clearing exchanges proliferate around the world. You know, as we get the, uh, the design optimized and uh, are able to uh, sell it more widely into the market, this is what we're going to see. Uh, they will become standard in their designs and their practices and as they standardize these designs and practices, they will be more easily networked together, just like our computers are networked together on the internet. And uh, so that's what we'll have. And this will allow us to maintain control of credit at the community level, which is essential for a democratic government and uh, economic equity to emerge. So we will have a globally useful means of payment that's locally controlled and democratic. So here are some references. Uh, I mentioned it, The Innovator's Dilemma this morning. Uh, these are two of my books, and uh, I should have put on here uh, the, the book Switch by the uh, Heath Brothers. These are my websites, beyondmoney.net, reinventingmoney.com, and my Vimeo site, there are some video materials there. I also have a YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you. So Ryan, introduce yourself and then go for it. Hello everyone. My name is Ryan.
Ryan Cherblini. I lead developer relations at a startup in San Francisco called Ripple Labs. And uh, really happy to be here today because Thomas just gave a great introduction and I'm gonna segue into what he was talking about by giving a concrete demo of how some of these community credit systems can actually work. So to do so, I'm gonna go to my computer, get a demo going. Uh, so I went to Berkeley, so it's always good to be back in the East Bay as well. Uh, I feel like this is a place that's thriving with ideas. Um, let's see what we can do here on the demo screen. Can we uh, get the AV switch to the other? Great, thank you. So Thomas was just talking about what uh, community credit exchanges look like, and I was put together this little schematic here for uh, what a let system could look like for goodwill. So imagine that you have a central bookkeeper, um, and everybody that might be a business in this community has set trust to that bookkeeper, so they're willing to say, I trust this issuer of the credit. And the trust lines can work both ways. So let's see, I need to switch in that. So in this schematic, each member of the community trusts the issuer for 100 goodwill, and e the bookkeeper trusts each member back for 100 goodwill. So this enables everybody to be able to transact in these goodwill tokens with one another without the bookkeeper having to issue it. So the maximum balance on each side could be negative 100 goodwill, you can go into debt that much, or you can have a positive balance of 100, that's the maximum you could have based on the trust issued in the system. So this is a system of mutual trust liquidity, and it allows people to send goodwill to one another with, uh, without ever having any to begin with. So just credit balance system. So moving on to the middle section, let's imagine you got multiple LED systems. So this is what Thomas was referring to uh, when he was talking about uh, the inability to kind of send the barter between the two exchanges. So you can imagine that the two bookkeepers say we have a LED system in San Francisco and a LED system in Seattle. There could be mutual trust amongst the bookkeepers, which would allow liquidity between the assets issued by those two bookkeepers. You could also enable inter-exchange commerce by having personal trust liquidity. So one member of a San Francisco barter could also have trust to a member of the Seattle barter, and that would enable them to facilitate the transactions through, uh, through this type of system. And then you could also have mutual membership. So one person could maybe spend half their time in Seattle and half their time in San Francisco, and they might be a member of both communities, and they might be able to hold both. So if Alice wanted to pay Bob in a different Let's community, that payment could actually ripple through the system uh, adjusting the balances along the way of all the intermediaries and counterparties along the way. So it's a system organized of mutual trust and it allows for informal interpersonal member trust. So that's kind of like how Ripple could facilitate inter-let's exchange. Uh, now imagine that um, people wanted to actually interface with more traditional modes of finance like US dollars or other currencies. So Alice might be able to pay Bob and Alice only has goodwill but Bob wants to receive US dollars. Um, there might be members of the Goodwill Exchange who might have a debt of Goodwill and be willing to pay down that debt in US dollars. So they could say, I will buy, I will buy US dollars from one exchange and sell Goodwill, um, and that would uh, facilitate kind of a foreign exchange of Goodwill dollars to US dollars so that Alice can pay non-Goodwill members while Charlie can get a surplus of Goodwill. So that starts the cycle all over again. Uh, any questions to this point? It's a little bit dense, I know. Yes? What is uh, Ripple uh, about? Like, how, do you, how do you make money? Um, so Ripple itself is an open source protocol oh. for value exchange. Ripple Labs is a for-profit company that develops that protocol and actually integrates it with banks so that banks can do real-time fund settlement internationally. So sending euros to US dollars in real time. Like transactive fees? 
not transaction fees, just like integration services. So this is valuable to them, and they pay money to Ripple Labs to do that. So that's just kind of a schematic overview of how that system on Ripple would work. And I actually set up a demo to show you how it can work in real time. So let's go to that. So I set up a Ripple gateway, and you can imagine this gateway as the kind of hub of community trust that I referred to earlier. And since Chong Kee was kind enough to give me an invite to this event, I made it the Baybucks gateway. Um, so we have two users of the, the Baybucks system here. Um, if we go to the tab here, you can see that uh, Chong Kee has trusted the Baybucks gateway for 1,000 Baybucks, and so have I. So now that we have established trust and we've said we trust the issuer of Baybucks dollars, uh, we are able to receive Baybucks dollars. So the Baybucks gateway is going to send Chong Kee 500 Baybucks dollars. So now Ripple is doing a path find to look through the network. One moment. This is purely an example, I'm sorry. Sorry for not clarifying. No, that's okay. The demo. The demo gods are not kind, typically. <laughs> So get ready, Chong Kee's about to get 500 bay bucks. How many do you actually have? All right, I'm going to confirm the transaction. Now keep an eye on the top right. Transaction cleared. Might have to re-log into his account, but let's see. Yeah. Oh, it's there, but I have to re-log in. I knew it. And voila, Sean Key has 500 Bay Bucks. So I also uh, am a Bay, I've trusted Bay Bucks, but I don't have any Bay Bucks in my Bay Buck wallet. You can see my wallet is here. I have 10 US dollars and I've got some XRP, which is the currency native to the Ripple protocol. So I'm actually going to uh, receive a payment from Sean Key. So I don't have any Bay Bucks, but I've trusted the Bay Bucks gateway because I believe in the whole idea and I think it's going to have value. So now Chong Kee can take some of the Bay Bucks that he just got sent from the Bay Bucks gateway to me. You're going to give me 200. You want to keep some of those Bay Bucks. And here we go. You're going to send it to me. There we go. I got 200 bay bucks. <coughs> so that was just an example of what I showed earlier on that first slide of people trusting a central issuer of an asset and then receiving it um, even when the issuer isn't sending it to them. He just sent it to me because we both established that trust to the issuer. Um, but say, for example, I decided to move out of the Bay Area and I don't want to receive bay bucks anymore, but Chunky has a debt to settle because I need my bar ticket paid for for getting here. 
So I want US dollars for that. I don't know if that's going to be able. So now say Chongqi needs to send me US dollars, but he only has Bay Bucks in his wallet. How is that going to work? Let's see. So he's going to send me a payment again, but this time I want 10 US dollars. And it looks like there's a two to one exchange rate between Bay Bucks and US dollars. So he can send me 20 Bay Bucks and it'll give me 10 USD. How is that exchange rate determined? Uh, my math in my head, making it up. But is, is there a way to do that in reality? Yeah, so anybody on the Ripple protocol can serve as a market maker. So they would hold Bay Bucks and they would hold US dollars. So they could submit orders to an order book that said, I'll buy Bay Bucks for this much and I'll sell US dollars for this much. So I'm going to confirm this transaction. I'm going to have Chunky send me 10 US dollars and he's going to pay 20 Bay Bucks. I got, see, there it is. Chunky sent me $10, but he you can see his balance went down 20 Bay Bucks. And my US dollar balance went up $10. So the way that happened is that there might have been a market maker on the Ripple protocol who had been holding Bay Bucks and had also been holding US dollars and they set that exchange rate that Thomas was asking about. So they've submitted offers to an order book and when the payment is sent, those offers are picked up off the order book to facilitate the conversion of the Bay Bucks into US dollars. Is the exchange rate calibrated across multiple uh, local currency markets? Uh, the exchange rate is open and constantly fluctuating, so anybody can be submitting exchange rate exchanges, uh, submitting offers in real time to the book. So it's not calibrated against any real world Forex market. It's just its own independent exchange. So people make their decisions on the Ripple Exchange based on what's going on in other Forex markets. So it's transaction based and not policy based, or I mean, how does that work? What do you mean by policy based? Well, so I mean, in that in that ex in that transaction, you'd exchange a specific rate. So I mean, could you set it up if you were to be a market maker with some policy, or is it just I see an order come in, I'm try to fulfill it? I mean, how is that? Right. Yeah. So the orders are just sitting on top of the order book. So the Ripple protocol, by default, finds the cheapest path to actually make the payment happen. So if you're sending a big payment, it's going to go through a bunch of different orders and just keep picking them off the top. So you would just pass as an offer as a, as a market maker or an yeah. outstanding offer in the system and find that? That's right. Yeah. Okay. So I can actually show you what that looks like. So I can go to trade here. So based on, based on the currency holdings in my wallet, I can submit offers for like <coughs> Bay Bucks and US dollars. So actually, let's see, let's do it. I haven't set up all the trust lines needed, but basically I can submit offers to a book. You can go to this site. This is the real-time data from the Ripple Exchange. So these are all the markets that are active. So uh, lots of people on Ripple like to trade against cryptocurrencies like XRP or Bitcoin. Um, so they're depositing fiat money into the Ripple system, having it issued to them by a central gateway, kind of like the Baybuck example, and then they're converting that on an open market to cryptocurrency or to other fiat currencies. Yes? Uh, I don't know, like, I, something that I picked up earlier was the, the Baybucks, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, I don't know exactly, but it's contingent upon the idea of not converting to USD. And I wonder, like, it seems like just like in my consumption of the uh, big ups, I'm not sure you can see where this is going. It seems like it's just we've made a huge leap, like, as far as what's possible and what you're doing. And it just seems like there's this huge gulf of space between what I, at least my understanding of what big ups was doing and, and what you're doing. And then I have another uh, question around, like, the idea of trust. And, like, you mentioned trust a couple of times. Like, how is that trust established? How is it maintained? And does the system itself have any responsibility for creating and maintaining that trust? Absolutely. So, um, to address your first question, I just wanted to give the caveat this was for purely example purposes only. Um, 
not necessarily a reflection of uh, the philosophical threads that have been unwound throughout this conference. This is just me showing the capabilities of a system, um, not necessarily saying that that's the ideal use case for these type of credit systems. Um, as for trust, so trust has to be explicitly set by every user of the system. So I couldn't hold Baybucks dollars unless I have actually trusted the Baybucks issuer. So Chongqi wouldn't have been able to send me the Baybucks if I hadn't already trusted that explicitly. So I have to go here and I have to add trust to the issuing address of Baybucks. So that's like saying, uh, when I go to Wells Fargo, I give them $100, I trust them to hold that money for me and issue me a balance. So same concept for, for the system. are determining who they trust. So when I issue trust to an entity, that means that I'm willing to accept their asset as valuable. So like, I wouldn't trust uh, some random guy in the street saying, you know, I wouldn't trust him for a million dollars on Ripple because his million dollars is probably not gonna come through in the real world when I actually need it. Yes? Um, <laughs> this is just a low-level protocol. Uh, know, know your customer and anti-money laundering systems that need to be layered on top of this for this to fundamentally replace the way the money moves around the world. Um, we're, we're getting a question explosion. Do we want to keep building them, or should we move to the panel? Or? Yeah, let's move on to Dan. Then we can go back to Q&A after Dan has finished. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. So let me um, give you a little background of, of uh, my world. Uh, I started this work um, back when I was negotiating the NAFTA agreement. It was within, within, it was a mutual recognition document between the engineers of Mexico, the United States, and Canada. The idea was that the engineers would be able to freely go from any country to perform acts of infrastructure building and just wonderful things. So um, we tried very, very hard uh, for that and we failed. And being in the kitchen of NAFTA, I, I was able to see things that, that literally shocked me. And I, then I took an MBA just so I could articulate what I saw in this whole thing. <laughs> and um, it, it turns out that I spot, I think that I spotted a little tiny flaw in market capitalism, which could be corrected, all right? And it's taken me 23 years to articulate that, of course, but relative to the entire enormity of the problems with market capitalism, it seems like this little flaw could be uh, corrected. So, um, Curiosity is the focus of this, uh, uh, this thing. Now, why do we go for the resume, okay? The resume is the point of failure. That's where we submit ourselves to corporations. Okay, now they take the resume, and then they sequester you where you are, and you don't leave. The one example I use is an engineer for Starbucks, an engineer for Boeing, could never work for the other company. They're not swapped. Um, so once you're in Boeing, you can't leave and they don't want you to leave, okay, because that gives you power. I mean, that's what was one of the discussions we had earlier about the, uh, you know. So, um, and they do this in, in many interesting ways. So to be able to transfer um, intangible assets is the fundamental idea here. Right now, there's a lot of talk about land, labor, capital. Everything here has been land, labor, capital, complaining about how we deal with these things. And those are tangibles. Okay, now the idea now is to create an economy that's built on intangibles, which are social, creative, and intellectual capital. These are the things that people are desiring, and I've heard this many times. We want to be you know, valued for what we know, how we can participate in the community, and those intangible things that make the community great. Okay, 
Um, one example, again, is a bridge that an engineer builds. It may cost $10 million to build that bridge, which is the tangible value of that bridge, but the intangible value is it introduces billions and billions of hours of productivity into a community that's, that's separated by a river so they can you know, learn from each other and transfer art and, and have families and have parties. So that capital is not articulated. It's invisible. There is no accounting system for intangible uh, value. So what we're attempting to do, I'm not saying we've done it, we're attempting to create such an accounting system for intangible value. And if we can do that, then we can do a lot of things. So here's the world we live in. Um, I think everybody knows what the problems are. If you boil them down, boil them down, boil them down, they come down to three, in my opinion. And I've, I've actually have seen these in a lot of Tom's work. He identifies them in, in different ways. Um, competition. Um, we're competing for scarce resources, land, jobs, money. Um, we're killing each other. We're just beating the hell out of each other. And it sucks. Um, hierarchy is, is we rate each other. We rank each other on a scale of 1 to 10, winner, loser, holy, unholy. We've got all these elaborate systems to rank each other on a scale, okay, of, of hierarchy scale. And we're very familiar with that. We grew up with it in school and church and all that. The second one is a moral hazard called asymmetric information. So if one person has more information than you have, they've got this moral hazard to take advantage of you in a transaction. Okay, so market capitalism only works when there's perfect information. That's a thesis of market capitalism. With this imperfect information, it becomes very inefficient. So to preach about the efficiencies of market capitalism with incomplete information is, is a fallacy. So we're going to wipe those, these three things out, okay? And then we're going to talk about how economy gets built. Okay, so here's the essence of um, curiosity. You understand this, you understand everything. Uh, what you do with curiosity is instead of you tag yourself with Wikipedia articles, okay, so your profession or the things you're interested in, you tag yourself with Wikipedia articles. This is something we do all the time when we get on the web. We tag ourselves with all the spam bait that we see on the web. Well, now we're going to tag ourselves with Wikipedia articles. And then we're going to rank ourselves on a scale of student to teacher. Now, students and teachers do not compete with each other. In fact, what we have is supply and demand. See, now you see a proto-economy starting to form. Now, there's six bars here, and they're corresponding to six sigmas on a bell curve by no accident. Those are standard deviations from the norm. Okay, so now we can, if, if two people are close together in a certain topic, they have become collaborators. They're actually discussing a subject between them, and they're, into, and they're iterating between them, and they're that's a very high value position when two people are close. It's a high value, it's a supply and demand, and factors of production in the middle. So you see this proto-economy forming. Okay, now it's sitting on a bell curve, I can pull some statistics off of that, and I can predict the likelihood that a certain group of people could execute a business plan. In other words, I can predict future productivity. Now if you look at the dollar, the dollar is backed by debt. Debt is a measure of future productivity. You're going to work in the future to pay back that debt. I've got this other currency, which is backed also by future productivity. So you have two currencies backed by the same thing, the convertible. In fact, it's a hedge. Mother of all hedge funds. If we could pull something like this off. So, how do we do that? What is the second currency? I don't uh, Oh, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying, we could, they could be innovation bonds. Let's call them innovation oh, okay. bonds. If we can prove the intangibles. Yeah, if we can, if we can predict the probability that this community can execute a particular business plan, we'll call it an in, in, innovation bond, and we could sell those in the community, and they could be convertible to dollars because they're both performing the same thing, future productivity. So let me, let me just review that really quick. Step one: users tag themselves with WikiLeaks. Step two, user assigns their intentions on the scale here. Okay, now this forms an asset. When you've got quality and quantity married together, hard bound, that's an asset. All assets are described in terms of a quality and quantity. So what we've done is we create a personal API, which is your resume or your persona. You don't have to deploy your entire resume. It's a personal API that you control. You can deploy, you can retract. Okay, and this is how we would all inter in interact with each other in sort of an algorithmic method. Okay, now it's also fully encrypted. Okay, that would be a personal API. You have no idea who that is. It could be a product, it could be a service, 
It could be a person. It could be a team of persons. Okay? It could be anything. You just don't know what it is. It tells a story, but it's perfectly encrypted. Now, the total score is zero. Okay, those are the people who have the most benefit in society, the ones who want to learn as much as they teach. You just can't have some guy you know, standing on a pedestal teaching all the time. They need to learn something. Um, or it could be a product. Okay, so if you, you match a product to a person algorithmically, okay? So that's your private key. Now, if you look at Wikipedia, you can visualize Wikipedia in many, many different ways. And Chris Harrison's done it. You know, all the links are connected, and you can see where... We can see the, the trail of WikiLinks as you go through it. And if you drill in, it's hugely detailed. And that's just one subject. Okay, this is the public key. Okay, when you put the private key on top of the public key, then the information, the secrets within are revealed. That's why you're using the links. You're using their platform. That's, yeah, it was created by all of us. It's created by the public. That's something that we all created, Wikipedia. It's a tremendous asset. Okay, now it's a centralized way of describing a job or a community. So the person at Starbucks can't be articulated by the person at Boeing because they're using the same ontology for things. Okay, so this is one of the one of the benefits we would do with this. So if you were to take um, activity, you could, you could look at Wikipedia and you drop the private key on top of the public key. These are the sorts of graphics you have. This happens to be an uh, editorial war during Arab Spring. But imagine if a decision made in Hollywood, in, in um, Hollywood, or even the government, you can immediately see what the implications are way downstream. You can respond to it a whole lot faster and crisper. Okay. Uh, the, now this is a fairly long discussion. It's actually quite technical. I've really, you know, skimmed it down for this discussion. I have several videos on it. And so people think this is really new, a new idea that Dan's coming up with, but it's not. It's big data. This is how they got you. They know more about you than you know about yourself because you're clicking around and you're performing this exact same task with your name attached. So there's there is you, and you're surrounded by social graph, you got all these these server farms who are you know mining your data. So you know you, you just don't have a chance. So what does <laughs> curiosity do? is we shut the lights out on big data. We go dark. Because we're encrypted. They no longer know who we are. Okay? You could now put a tool booth on big data. So if they want to take my information, they have to pay me for it. And then you can be sort of anonymous until the point of transaction. It's like, like Craigslist. You know, you can talk about the lawnmower all day long, but when you finally said, yeah, I want to buy that lawnmower, then you reveal your personal information and then you can have a transaction. Right now, they're just sucking your data, and you know you, you, you have no, no choice. You know, but now you can you can get paid for your data. Okay, so this eliminates competition because students and teachers don't compete. There's no incentive to cheat because if I say I'm the best arm wrestler, I'm going to get a challenge, and I don't want that. <laughs> okay, so so there's no incentive to cheat. When you don't have an incentive to cheat, you can wipe out massive layers of vetting mechanisms, like the legal system and escrow accounts and real estate agents. All the brokers are out there playing that game. Okay, so if you have you eliminate hierarchy, uh, and you also because you're not you're not rating yourself on the scale of one to ten, you're rating yourself horizontally, student to teacher. Okay, that's a market. It's not a hierarchy. And then finally. The asymmetric information just disappears. Nobody can have more information than you have of them. Okay, so we've we've done this. Now this is the exact same calculus that Wall Street uses to create a derivative. A derivative is simply watching the rate of change of information with respect to time. Okay, so everything here that I'm showing you is the exact same calculus that's very common to anybody. So you know, try that with a resume. Okay, so. Here's the, here's the crypto play. Co-engineers is an um, engineering firm that I, that I own, and what we're trying to do is use smart contracts, which is an adjudicated smart contract with a three-party contract where there's a judge and adjudicator. And we want to put an engineer at that point so they can vet like construction contracts, they can vet insurance claims, so they can vet all, all types of organs of, of different um, projects. So we would decentralize or disaggregate the engineer from the project using Curiosity. So the engineer who's assessing the project has no material interaction with the project except to adjudicate at that point. At some point, that starts looking like a proof of work. It's a proof of performance. 
A proof of work is a cryptographic met method of determining order in a set of transactions. Okay, and there's, a, there's still a big chasm between the two, but it's just too sexy to not try to figure out how a proof of performance and a proof of work could somehow be deemed um, a way to create new currency. Okay, much like Bitcoin creates a new currency every time the puzzle is solved, we can also create a new currency every time a social puzzle or an infrastructure puzzle is solved. Now you have a currency which is backed by intrinsic value. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to build this, and it's open source. We've got the source code. You want to see it? Help yourself to happiness. We're trying to get other coders to build on this, to help us build this. But the idea is we're just going to walk away from the old economy. Just going to let it, let it atrophy, it, it, you know, let it do its thing. And we're just going to walk away and build a new economy. Okay, and we're going to use the basis of this is we flip from an economy of scarce intangibles to an economy of abundant intangibles. Okay, so we're hoping that this is, this is um, something that other people want to help us work on. Yeah. And... The key features are it's a personal API, so you own it. I mean, nobody can take it away from you. Own it. You can you can retract it like you can a YouTube video. You can deploy it. You can deploy your persona. It's not just one individual. If you're an artist and a scientist, you can deploy different personas or together. Uh, it's user controlled information. It's cryptographic in nature. Matches supply and demand. Anonymous to the point of transaction. Multiple persona. You literally manufacture social capital. It's predictive. You can do discovery, scenario testing valuation of intangible assets. That's what Curiosity does. Okay, and we built a lot of it already and we're just looking for, for more help. Um, that's my little piece. It goes on. There's more after this. But we're going to stop here. Thank you. puts the money in the bank, the seller... So it's a given amount. It's not like they compete for, for a figure, so right. there's no competition in that. Right, so the engineer goes, was the contract fulfilled? Yes, no, and it's on a smart contract that Ripple's going to build. Um, and, right. Sure. <laughs> we are waiting, man. We are just frothing at the mouth for these things to come out. But then you flip the switch, and then the money gets transferred or not. How do they pick? How does the project owner pick which engineer if they don't, they can't see? Well, we would use Curiosme to pick the engineer. Somebody who's got the experience to, to handle that. So you just moment. pick, you get to see it, they release the data because they want to be considered? Well, we're not going to see anything. It's decentralized, completely decentralized. I know it's it's a little... I'm just trying to understand this, um, which engineer does which piece and how does, how do they inter how does the project owner interact with these engineers so that they can select who does what part or is it just he it's thrown out into the open source and the engineers all work on it and then the money is released to them but who gets what piece? Well you don't get to select the judge who proceeds over your case, do you? No. Okay, so you won't so if you've got it's a, it's it's a very it's a very objective observation. But but I guess what I'm asking from the engineer side, how is the is their payment sorted? Okay, well their payment their payment will be a percentage of the transaction, just like a, any cryptocurrency would be. Any any proof of work would result in a payment to the individual who solved the puzzle, plus the introduction of more of more of that scarce currency into circulation. So it, it, it mimics. We're trying to mimic that essential critical function that a cryptocurrency performs. Right. And in a in a intrinsic way, so it, it's it's we're, it's challenging. We, don't, we yeah, can't yeah, yeah. say we figure it out. Fascinating. Wow. Who's next? Okay. Um, thank you, 
questions. <clears throat> for Ripple, because I was really concerned by what he pointed out, where essentially talking about a mechanism that allows you, when times you're talking about, you don't want to be able to cash out your local community currencies back into the US dollar or whatever, right? Because that defeats a lot of the purpose of recirculating within the local currency. Well, that, 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 that doesn't mean that somebody else can't make a market. If somebody wants to deal in, in the local currency and buy and sell it for dollars, that's, you have no control over that. Right. So, but that provides a backdoor, essentially, to allow you to cash it out. But you're also, somebody is buying it at the same time, right? It's not right. just letting somebody cash it out. It's bringing a new participant into the local exchange. Yeah, so because they have to accept it. The other yeah. yeah. Um, and the other question I have, which is sort of about the adjudicators, is you don't get to choose at all. It's yeah. it's a sorted randomly by the right. software. And we're only doing with engineers because that's what I know, that's what my company does. Right. But any other, we're not sure. limiting to that. And that's what Ingenesis is. Any person who is a creator, uh, a creative, is an Ingenesis. So that's kind of the word we made up to, to kind of talk about the How do you keep them honest then? There's no motivation to cheat. Right. There's no incentive. You cheat, you, know, you lose more, it's more expensive to cheat than it is to do it right. It's the same, it's the same incentive behind a crypto. So you're recruiting, recruiting other types of businesses similar to how you have an engineering firm that's going to... Well, what we want to do is we want the engineers to start trading a currency among themselves and reconcile every couple of months so that we, everybody can get paid. So everybody hires each other. Okay, so, you know, there's a lot of different ways to get... It just aspires web after this, so I, I don't want to go down that. Go ahead. Yeah, um, question about the Ripple protocol. Um, uh, so you have this network of of trust between users, and I'm just imagining like first person perspective from a user, you get to see your own adjacencies, but somehow the best path is found. Is there like you're not using a central trusted data source to find that path, right? It's mm -hmm. peer to peer traversal of some kind. Yeah, so you could think of Ripple like a gigantic network graph of trust, right? So there's nodes, and then the edges of the graph are basically the trust that have been set. So if I want to transact with you, we might not necessarily trust each other, but there is a path of trust where the currency that I send can ripple through the intermediaries in real time. And that's kind of housed on this peer-to-peer -peer ledger, this distributed network of servers that are constantly validating the transactions. And so it finds some path, but how do you even get to see beyond one hop how it gets there? I, I could actually, I'll, I'll show you an animation after of that okay. transaction that I did so you can see okay. how, the, how the funds actually write it. Right. It's true that you don't select the judges that preside over your case, but the actual selection of judges is not a black box, and it's something that public and defendant satisfaction actually doesn't even really factor into it. But for like engineers, for example, for years we were measuring productivity in the thousands of lines of codes produced, and for obvious reasons that results in like, not the best solution. <laughs> Um, so, if we focus on what is data, what is objective, what is quantitative, um, how can we how can we have accountability for the qualitative and sort of out of box thinking? It's it's difficult to a self select for because people don't necessarily have insight into where their strengths and weaknesses are, mm -hmm. and to b to quantify for things like ingenuity or um, you know being mission driven, all these other things that make good engineers but aren't necessarily easy to to, to right. plot out. So when I put my engineering profile out, I went to music school, okay. And I would add that to it. So in average, so I would have mechanical engineer, music school, MBA. Okay, that tells a different story. So it's really quick that my ID becomes different than his. He's an engineer as well. But within a few steps, we're different people. We're different personas. We're, in, we're actually um, we're, we're unique. Okay, so um, in lines of code, you're right. That's not the right way of doing it. But a contract, like an AIA contract for construction, that's very well set up in steps where you have a Gantt chart which defines all the different milestones and you choose to put a contract at each one of those milestones. But put, you know, and this is negotiated by all parties. Um, and, and this is just the first baby step forward. So it doesn't answer all questions, but statistically they get resolved pretty darn quick. With just a few data points out there, you can make some pretty darn good predictions over trust for uh, competence for uh, incentive to cheat. I guess the, the cheating makes it seem like volitional, but what I'm getting at is, is just the lack of insight that you have about the stuff we're trying to measure. Well, we'll get better at it. 
Okay, so it's, you know, the resume, people spend hours and hours and hours writing their resume and tweaking it and all this other stuff. Well, it's not like you just blow one of these, these things out. You're going to have to work it and, and get to know yourself. It's, it's going to be a, a growth process. I mean, it's a different way of organizing ourselves.
together. It's not obvious, and um, and I know sometimes I think it's there was one way we, I think we figured out, right? We were talking oh, chatting yeah, online oh that God, could work, so and then we kind of well, maybe we don't want. To. So there's actually a very complex thing that we're I'm still sure. we're still kind of discussing. And my blog's got a, like a million words on it. I've looked at this from every single angle, <laughs> and and there's just so many different directions we can go with it. There is no revenue model for Curiosity. It's completely free. There never will be a revenue model. It's open source, open domain, no attribution. Go for it. But what comes off of that, every every entrepreneur would know exactly what to do next. The data they get, they have to now build the receptors for that API. Okay, so most entrepreneurs would know exactly what to do next if they had the data that Curiosity produces. So we just have to build that thing first, decentralized, uh, you know, on a smartphone. Uh, so nobody can own it. If, 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 if they want to shut us down, they got to shut themselves down, um, sort of thing. Um, so that's the intent. So that's what we're talking about is, okay, now we're entrepreneur mode. How are we going to make this thing work for bay bucks? How are we going to make it work for engineers? How are we going to make it work for insurance, self-insuring, uh, you know, with Ripple? I mean, all the technology is just laid out on the table. We just have to start putting it together like a scaffolding. It's completely unknown. We are we're all kind of <laughs> discussing maybe this, maybe not. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, I have one more question, which is um, Thomas and, and Chonky, do, do, you, do you foresee any reactions from more traditional banks about um, the ideas of creating other currency? And at what point do you think there would be this, this kind of uh, nervousness or, or potential re, you know, regulatory reaction or people trying to shut you down? Very quickly, because Thank we have less than five minutes. Oh, sorry. The, the Bank of England um, actually issued a report very recently, about two months ago, I think, uh, discussing cryptocurrency. Big, a lot of time spent on big, account, Bitcoin, but just crypto in general. And for central banks, generally, they claim, uh, and I believe them, I think they're honest, uh, because it, it makes sense. The, the central bank's main concern is this how do we keep the stability of the national currency system? in a way that would not cause this huge fluctuation and that causes all kinds of upheaval in the financial sector as well as the real economy. So their worry is that if adoption of alternative currency, cryptocurrency, and so on and so forth becomes widespread, let's say it represents 10, 20%, 30% of the national GDP, what would happen? If number one is the central bank actually will lose control because then this section is, is strong enough and big enough that when it fluctuates, the central bank can't do anything about it because they don't control that bit of the currency. So they're very worried about that. Um, that B BOE basically thinks it's not going to happen because of a lot of inherent problems with um, crypto that would limit their adoption, even though right now I call it really a, a greed driven adoption because a lot of people adopt it because they think they're going to be a billionaire. But <laughs> um, <laughs> we don't know what really will happen. The, the, the ultimate point that they make in their paper, which is in the very last footnote, <laughs> okay, that is like almost no one read, is basically they say, we have no idea what the, um, they, ca they call it the Nash equilibrium scenario is for any of these cryptocurrencies. That means they don't know what the competition field is, they don't know what's the best strategy, they don't know what's the best counter strategy, no one knows. So this is actually a complete unknown. Well, historically, governments have always come against uh, competing currencies. Well, there's innumerable examples of that, and I write about some of those in some of my books. Vargo and Schwanenkirk in, in the 1930s, for example. But, uh, you know, I used the example earlier today about uh, digital uh, photography. And the irony of the situation is that digital photography was invented at Eastman Kodak. But as, <laughs> as Clayton Christensen <laughs> points out in The Innovator's Dilemma, it doesn't make sense for dominant companies to develop technologies that are going to compete with their cash cows. So it's left to nimble startups to do it. And that's exactly what happened, and Kodak ended up in the, in the dump. So I think the same thing is going to happen with, uh, with currencies. 
but there, there are even mainstream economists that have been advocating for competition in currency for a long time. And uh, when real competition does develop against the dollar and the euro and the other political currencies, uh, it's going to show them up for what they are, uh, very inferior in terms of uh, functionality and, and equity. And that's why the banks are, are afraid of it. You have this uh, government banking uh, collusive arrangement uh, that's trying to protect their monopoly on credit. Too big to fail. Well, not too big for us to win. <laughs> Until we win. Right. <laughs> and I think that uh, we had a long previous discussion about how, in a certain way, not <coughs> just curious, curiosity on its own, and there was other, yeah, there's, there's other things going that on. actually could actually reverse this thing. But it's, it's fascinating. But we don't have time now. <laughs>